race and ethnic people, I am going to try to do something I think that's going to be very difficult uh, in 15 minutes, which is try to get across just the gist of William J. Wilson's so-called declining significance of race argument. Um, this is an argument that he first made in 1978, uh, that he updated uh, three or four times, just about once a decade since then. Um, it's been heavily criticized and heavily scrutinized, but it's withstood all the criticism, and I, I think it's probably one of the most important pieces of work done, or bodies of work done, on um, race and ethnicity in the United States in the last 50 years. The background to this argument, again, called the declining significance of race, was a number of things, but among them was the immense criticism that affirmative action was getting um, in, in, through the 1970s, really. Uh, and Wilson, uh, among the other things that he aimed for, was trying to get a sense of whether affirmative action was working or not. And so he did tremendous research into what I'm going to superficially call um, sort of black economic achievement or black economic success. And I'm going to post a chart that I tried to make and I was going to use it here but you can't see it very well. It's a really simple chart though. Uh, I posted it on the course website uh, and it's under the title Declining Significance of Race. And what Wilson found after all this research was that black economic uh, achievement or success which, which had been sort of slowly improving through the 1950s and into the early 1960s. I mean, this was a boom time in the United States. Blacks' economic uh, fortunes were increasing slowly, but somewhat steadily, until about the middle 1960s. After that, what happened, and, and that's the point in time, by the way, folks, when we get the passage of the Civil Rights Bill in 1964, um, the Voting Rights Act in 1965, and then toward the end of that decade, we get um, the beginnings of affirmative action in the Nixon administration, of all, of all places. Uh, and what Wilson found in his look at, at black economic achievement was that right about the time in the mid to late 1960s, when those things are coming online, providing more opportunities for blacks, he sees this divergence in their economic fortunes. The black middle class has its fortunes increase rapidly. But the group that he labeled the underclass actually had its fortunes get worse and worse from mid-1960s all the way up through the present. And so then the, the, the obvious question is, what happened? You know, what happened in the middle 1960s besides the passage of civil rights legislation? That might, you know, that might account for the great, um, you know, increase in black middle class success, but it doesn't account for what happened to the black underclass. Why are they doing even worse when this legislation was intended to help them? Well, for one thing, Wilson uh, argued, having new legal opportunities doesn't benefit you much if you don't have the economic resources with which to take advantage of them. So that, for instance, if, you know, now that lunch counters were desegregated in the U.S. South, what did that matter to blacks who were too poor to afford lunch on a regular basis, you know, uh, in a restaurant? Um, what good does it do you to have new access to universities when you don't have the money to take advantage of that opportunity? Okay, so that's one answer to the question, sort of what happened. Um, the other answer to the, to the question, you know, what created and sustains the black, uh, really the urban underclass, many of whom are black um, and Latino, um, that's a little bit more involved, um, but you can, you can see uh, these changes coming about um, beginning again in the 1960s and then accelerating through the 70s, 80s, and 90s. Among other things, you had the closing of factory jobs. Now, factory jobs had for 100 years in America been the route to the middle class for folks who couldn't afford, um, let's say, college education. Uh, in fact, you could be a high school dropout and in a factory job, you could walk into that job and in two weeks learn how to do a, an unskilled or semi-skilled job and you could be pulling down really good wages without lots of outside training. 
Okay, so this was the escalator. This was the route to the middle class for generations of Americans. Only just at that moment in time, the mid-1960s, when legal opportunities or legal barriers are removed for blacks, the economy is changing. Those factories in the urban areas that were built in the beginning um, decades of the Industrial Revolution are being torn down. And those that are being rebuilt are being rebuilt in urban areas, I'm sorry, in suburban areas um, outside the city, or they're being relocated overseas. Um, so what happened was essentially work disappeared, um, which was the, the when work disappears is the title of, of one of his uh, updates to his argument. Um, work disappeared from the city. The factory jobs went elsewhere. Um, the jobs that, um, and of course the U.S. Uh, economy was changing structurally at about the same time in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. What you had was factory jobs overall, manufacturing jobs, um, going down, being replaced by, to the extent that they were replaced, replaced by service jobs, burger flipping jobs, driving a taxi, that sort of thing. That you know might be able to um, provide sustenance to a family, but it's not the route into middle classdom. So, uh, in fact, if you watched New Orleans, oh, and, and so what happened was people left the inner city. The people who had means, the people who had capital, left the inner city because when the jobs went, the tax base fell. Okay, so you don't have um, General Motors, perhaps, in your downtown creating revenue for the city. You don't have all the workers at General Motors paying taxes on higher, relatively higher incomes to the city. So city revenues went way down all through the Rust Belt in America. It was hard for city to, cities to raise as much money as, as they used to for police, for teachers, um, for, for, for garbage workers. I mean, Detroit, um, all through the time that I lived there in the 80s and 90s, um, had a hard time picking up its garbage because uh, they had problems with the union and they had problems paying. Uh, to have the garbage picked up. And um, also in Detroit, by the way, um, the city emptied out of capital. It was really money that fled the city. Money and people with money. Okay. Um, many of the people, most of the people without money, who stayed, blacks and Latinos. Okay. Why was that? Well, they were poor in disproportionate numbers owing to centuries of discrimination that led up to um, these changes in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. Okay, again, I refer you to the timeline uh, of oppression that I talked about in the in the um, that I'm going to talk about in another lecture uh, to come. Um, I'm going to continue here just because I'm not sure I can do this better in another take. Um, so the cities, uh, if, if you watched what happened in New Orleans after um, Hurricane Katrina, you can see um, a microcosm in three days of what came to be known as white flight in the Rust Belt. Um, you know, calamity struck the city. The people who had the means got out. The people who didn't had to stay, and they were largely people of color. So this begins at least, it's a really uh, you know, thin account, but it begins at least to tell you the story of how um, our city started to die uh, particularly in the Rust Belt again in America, and why the jobs went elsewhere, and why um, poverty is so tight now, so constraining um, in the cities. And as for the title of his first book, which was roundly criticized, but stood up really through scrutiny, The Declining Significance of Race, uh, Wilson argued that, that for poor blacks, Race was, was less significant than it used to be as a barrier to their economic achievement. What was becoming more and more significant because of these changes in our economy was poverty itself. If you were poor and black in the city, it was your poverty, more so than it was your race, that kept you from achieving economically. Okay. What's the importance of the argument in the larger setting of our course? Well, for one, it it demonstrates for blacks, and again, I think you could make this argument for other groups. It wouldn't be as strong, I don't think, as the case you could make for blacks. Um, but for one thing, um, this his work, William J. Wilson's work, demonstrates that affirmative action didn't help the people that it was most intended to help. That is, poor people of color, uh, and by extension, maybe in another lecture sometime, um, poor women. It helped 
sorry, it helped people who, ha who already had a, some meager economic resources with which to take advantage of the new opportunities. Okay. And that meant for him, in shorthand again, um, the black middle class. Okay. Um, the more important upshot for, for me, and I haven't seen other people point this out, and I don't understand why. Um, for me, what this demonstrates is that for a lot of groups, certainly for blacks, what used to be racial oppression has morphed into a new form in the present, in the 2000s, and that's class oppression. Okay? Um, why is that important? Well, because we removed um, most of the legal race barriers um, by outlawing discrimination and setting in place an me enforcement mechanism, as I explained in the last lecture. Um, blacks, more than any other group, got trapped in our inner cities. Why? Because they were proportion they were poor, rather, sorry, they were poor in numbers far disproportionate um, to other groups. Okay. Why, were, why were a larger percentage of blacks poor than other groups? Well, you got to look to the legacy of 200 years of slavery and another 100 years uh, of Jim Crow discrimination, at least in the South. Okay. Um, when discrimination is legal, it's going to be worse. You know, people are going to take advantage of that, um, employers, landlords, and so on. Um, so the people who couldn't get out of the city were the groups that were pressed down into poverty by historical um, oppression. Okay, so 300 years of oppression pushes blacks in disproportionate numbers into the ranks of the urban poor and then changes in our economy lock them there. Okay, so that as Wilson says if you're a poor black in the city now um, it's your poverty more so than it's your race that traps you in the underclass. Okay, why is that important? Because class oppression is perfectly legal. Most forms of it. If you come to me, if you come to my apartment house and you want to um, rent one of my uh, apartments, um, but I don't like black people and I turn you away, I've broken the law. But if you come to my apartment building and you want to rent an apartment but you don't have money to pay for it, I tell you to get lost and it's perfectly legal. In fact, it's good business for me to tell you to get lost. So you, you see why this is of concern to me. What we've seen then is centuries of racial oppression morph into class oppression in our cities that is perfectly legal now. So, you know, in an eerily similar way to when Lincoln you know, declared with a wave of the pen, blacks are emancipated now, right? Congress in the mid-1960s declared something similar, blacks will no longer be discriminated against legally on account of their race. Both of those were somewhat hollow victories uh, for the black community. And as I say, I, I, I definitely ask you to think about this in connection with other groups to which the argument might apply. Okay, I didn't make it as clearly as I wanted to, but hopefully you can get the gist of this, um, and we can talk more about it um, online. Thanks.